is to relinquish your county commission, obviously, and I should say we are not starting from scratch because the commission has a legal system, has a legal step by legal step. We are also uh, always thinking, okay, so what is the that is supposed to bring us to it? And uh, mm -hmm. we often have data space. Definitely, the, the big vision that we were wondering what was it. So we would hear from you. Uh, then, uh, indeed, we would look at two case studies. And I would just invite colleagues who would be presenting them to not only think about what uh, are these case studies doing for the patients, healthcare systems, and society, but also how they connect with the European health data space and how they will benefit from this European health data space. So without further introductions, I would like to give the floor to our colleagues from the Commission, DigiSante, um, and we have with us Laurent Saunier and Guillaume Picot present uh, the legislation. Thank you very much and thank you for your introduction, visionary and, uh, and uh, supportive introduction for the, the law proposal of, of the European Health Data Space. So it's a, it's a multifaceted uh, well, uh, proposal. So we, we're going to work you through all those facets, and then we're going to have some time for uh, for questions. So I'll, I'll see if this works. Yeah, it does. Great, it works. So where why do we do this now? Why 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 is it the the right time to do this? So the, in 2020 there was a European strategy for a digital strategy for data. Uh, that was uh, set out for, by by, uh, by the by Europe, and and the COVID nineteen really demonstrated that when we act together, as you said, we we can do things. So the EU DCC example is a is a great example that when we when member states or organizations act together, we can we can do great things fast, respecting all the laws, and uh, so in the case of EU DCC, one point seven billion certificates have been issued, and sixty three countries have copied the European standard. So that's just to show how, if we want to do things, we have the, the good condition. So we want to maintain this momentum. And uh, I'm not sure I'm... Uh... Ah, so, so. So one thing is that we can do it now and that, and that the time is, is right. The other thing is that we have important challenges. And then, so I'll walk you through three of these really, really quickly. The first one connected to individuals that we all recognize even as citizens or as, as per people living in, in the EU that we don't have an equal access to health data. It's very fragmented. It's very difficult for even for patients to, to, uh, to carry with them important information like a patient overview. Uh, if you travel, even a simple patient overview with uh, uh, important uh, deadly allergies or, or implants or that kind of information that could be really life-saving is really hard to, to carry with you. So that's, that's one of uh, uh, important hurdles, low-hanging fruit. Another one is uh, that the market for, uh, for companies, and, and not the least for small and medium-sized companies, very fragmented, so it creates barriers to, to come in into uh, other markets in, in, because countries implement rules differently. And then the third one, uh, of course, is that uh, research and innovation is, is blocked, basically, because, because uh, the sharing of data is... is, is uh, different in, in different countries so here here are three of the goals that we want to uh, to uh, to achieve empower individuals to have greater access greater control over their health data so that's for all of us uh, ensure consistent framework for the use of data for what we call secondary use which is research innovation policy making and, and personalized medicine so basically using data of one person to to, to cure another patient and uh, the unleash the data economy. So to create a market where this health data can, can really make European lead the way as it has led the way with the UDCC. Now the, the European health data space doesn't happen in a vacuum. So we have nine different data spaces that, are, that have been um, announced. The health data space is the first one. So why is it the first one? The quick answer is it's because it's one, the one that matters the most. 
and, and the time is ripe for this one. So we'll go for, for, for the F1. It is uh, connected to, to different, uh, different things. So it's about infrastructure, it's about AI, it's about high performance computing. So there's a lot of technical details, but not just that. It has to be driven by stakeholders and the governments, e governance is crucial. So we'll, we'll come back to all of those aspects uh, in the case of the, of the health data space. On the legal side, it, it's not happening in a vacuum either. So we have, of course, when we are speaking about access to data, this is the, the health data space regulation is, is complementing GDPR. It's, it's, uh, it's a part of the health union. And then it's happening at the same time as other regulations, the Data Governance Act, the Data Act, the AI Act, that are also going to promote uh, a better use and a more secure use of, of our data. So, uh, and regarding the uh, medical device regulation, also we'll come back to that for EHR systems and, uh, and wellness uh, applications. So it's, it complements. Another great, great uh, aspect that we need to, because the, the, the benefits of, of, the, of the health data space are twofold. One, one is the health side where we expect uh, a better health for all of us. The other, the other side is the economical, the economic side. So we expect um, impact assessments have measured that we can expect over the next 10 years, five and a half billion uh, societal returns on for, for uh, the first, the primary use of health data and about the same for the secondary use. So that's a total of, of about 11 billions euros net returns that we expect uh, fr from uh, implementing this thing in 10 years. I leave it over to you. Thank you. Okay, so let's go to the uh, meaty, part, meaty part of the uh, regulation. So the first thing is, of course, what's the legal basis of the regulation? So what's the ground for it? Uh, the first one is Article 16 of the TFEU, which is basically on uh, the right to uh, personal protection of personal data and the right to privacy. I and mean, we are talking about health data, which is one of the most private and sensitive data that you can hold of. So of course, this is one of the main elements that we need to address. Uh, bear in mind, uh, and as I said here, is that the uh, regulation not only deal with personal health data, but also deal with non-personal uh, health data. Then you have Article 114. Article 114 of the TFU is really about the functioning of the internal market. As was raised by, uh, by Laurent, my colleague, uh, we're trying to make sure that we have a working internal market of uh, health data, where basically they can flow more easily between member states. They can, different people, stakeholders in different member states can have easy access to all these data and to actually uh, make better use and to develop better treatment, better tool, better medical device with all these data available. Now, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, we, we do that in, uh, in light also of, in full respect of the Article 168 of the TFEU. Um, the HDS do not intervene in the organization delivery of health service and the medical care of member states. It is not there to, to change the health service of the medical care system. It's there to uh, improve the data flow within the system. And this is a big difference. So, um, as we say, the objective is the effective use of health data. I mean, how we, we do that, I mean, basically, just as an over overview of how we try to achieve that and what kind of like the two pillars. The first pillar, pillar is really about primary uh, use of, of health data for the, for the uh, for normal health healthcare. And this will be dealt with through a uh, network which already exists, which is My Health at EU. And there, as we already said, we're trying to empower the individual about to control their health data. We're trying to standardize and, and make mandatory certification of EHR system because EHR system are really important and really central to actually centralize in some way the uh, medical data flowing within the system. You will have a labeling, a voluntary labeling system for wellness apps. I mean, because they are developing and you have more and more people having Fitbits and having Apple Watch and all these things. And you would, you would try to promote and develop a European, uh, common European exchange format for this uh, information. So they have some form of interoperability. 
for the views of health data, the, the network, the network will be used for, will be health data at EU. Here you were talking about health data access body. I mean, be basically body designed to actually control access and the use of, of, uh, of data for reuse. There will be definition of purpose for how you can use the data. So you have some limit what you can do. It's not an open bar system. And there are definitely some forbidden use. I mean, like uh, we will talk later on. We were talking about data permits, secure environment, about some of the uh, tools and requirements and the process that need to be set up in order for the whole system to work. So this is really the kind of like overall uh, things to, to do. I mean, how, and how do we want to achieve that? I mean, of course, it's a legal text. I mean, the, the regulation, which also includes some governance aspect, which is important. But it's also important to have element, you know, physical element that actually will make it work. I mean, you need to have a good quality of data. If you have uh, shitty data in, and you're going to have shitty results out. Uh, you have to have an infrastructure because the whole thing require plumbing, you know, digital plumbing for the whole thing to work. And you need also to help uh, member state and uh, stakeholder to, to build on the, the, the possibility and to promote digitalization of data. So as I say, the scope of the HDS is really for individual to have greater control of the electronic health data. What does it mean? It means greater control on accessing, sharing the, the data with health professional, being able to easily add information, correct information, uh, restrict the access. I say, for example, you have a really bad experience with a doctor. I don't want the doctor to have access to my data anymore. Okay, good. How I can do it and how easily it can be done. You, can, you want to know who, which doctor, who had access to, to your data. It's really about having a better control about what's happening with your health data. It's about also having data in a common European format, strengthening interoperability. I mean, that's, that's also very important. So as I said, we're going to be having rules for the uh, electronic health record system. They're going to be rule and mechanism for secondary use of health data. And there's going to be uh, the mandatory cross-border infrastructure, which is my health at EU for primary use and health data at EU for secondary use. So chapter two, primary use of electronic health data. What does it mean? What kind of, of article? I mean, just to have a, a very quick breakdown of what's in the menu. So, first of all, we develop the additional right and really complementing the right provided by the GDPR. Uh, it's really about, you know, more like operationalizing them and making sure that, you know, op at operational level is possible. You have provision for access by health professional to electronic health data, how it can be done. I mean, what are the requirements? What are the limits? What about identification of some electronic health data to be integrated in the HDS, in the stage system? I and mean, what are the priority of what data need to be within integrated uh, as a first first uh, element. The electronic health record exchange format. I mean, again, interoperability is a key driver there to make sure that the data can flow and can be uh, moving from one place to another easily. Uh, registration of personal uh, uh, electronic health data and education management. These are important to, to know how to identify people having access to the data. Non-discrimination for the provision of telemedicine. Also, again, if you have telemedicine, how, in, how to make sure that actually the system works, because telemedicine will actually use quite heavily uh, the access to uh, electronic uh, health data. Uh, you will have a digital health authority that's going to be set up uh, and what it right and task to make sure that the whole system works at national and EU level. And then you have a mandatory participation to the My Health at EU, which is really the plumbing, the uh, uh, EU plumbing to, to make sure the whole system works. Finally, you have supplementary service to my health at EU, interoperability with third country international organization. And that we also saw with the EUDCC that some um, uh, international organization and uh, third country may want to plug in and to, 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 uh, to benefit some of the elements. And we need to have a, a system in place to manage this, this kind of request. So my health at EU, I said, it's already existing. So what's, uh, that's kind of like a brief overview of what, what it's implied at the moment and how it's going to evolve. At the moment, about 10 member states, have, the system is live. A lot of the member states, all of the member states actually say they will, they will join with, by, within 2025. So there's a big person, the big drive for, for member states to, to join in and to come in. And there's also no small reason because you also have the HDS. There are two services at the moment that must be working, the patient summary and e-prescription. And there are other services that's going to be expanded to, which is the medical image, laboratory result, discharge letter, rare disease data, 
and other health categories. I mean, really, we're trying to uh, slowly to build upon the uh, the result and to get something uh, done. There's a pilot project which explores the patient access to the health data and to make sure that they uh, they can have easy access and how how they can actually the whole system work. Finally, also the, the chapter three. This is about EHR system and uh, wellness application. So you have a mandatory self certification for EHR system. We want to make sure that um, EHR system actually uh, are, uh, are certified to make sure that they're interoperable, to make sure that they're actually working in the system. And this also includes with medical device and a high risk AI system. Then you have the whole list of different uh, article to make this self certification. Uh, work so you have the obligation to make hard, hard to, and the requirement of conformity you have the market surveillance authority to, to, to check whether this the certification system work you have the voluntary labeling for a wellness application and you have an eu database of certified ehr system to to list what is certified and what is not so people can also double check on on this element and now i think it's follow again and yeah, just a little parenthesis. We, we we know that there is a lot of text on those slides. Okay, so the, the why we did this is because we think that we're going to share those slides so you can have them and you can refer to. Okay, this is this article, so you can quickly go through it. Uh, the point is not to read it or right now. Okay, end of the parenthesis. But uh, so uh, secondary use. So secondary use is it is introduced with a set of minimum data categories that are gonna have to be made available. So there are, there are 15 data categories that are not listed here, but that are in this article saying that if you have those kind of data, you need to make them available potentially if someone requests them. Micro companies are excluded of this because we wanna protect you know, micro companies from being too, to have too much burden. Those those they, those data are going to be made available exactly as you said. Not it's not an open bar. Not to do anything anyhow, any way. It's they are going to be able to be accessed for certain purposes, not accessed for certain prohibited purposes, and they're going to be accessed uh, in what we call a secure processing environment. So in a in a computer environment that secures them. And that secure environment is going to be at an organization called the Health Data Access Body. So that Health Data Access Body is going to be the key organization in every state uh, or organizations. The states have the, the, the choice to, to, to make that multiple organizations. They are the key. So if I want to access data to use it as a secondary use, I go I, first, I, I need to have my legal basis to do that. So if I do research, I need to have a legal base to do my research. That, that's not the EHDS. Then I go to the health data access body and explain what kind of data I want to have, from whom, and for what purpose, and during what period. That's called a permit request or data access application. That health data access body is going to review this application, either grant it or deny it. And if they grant it, or if it, if it grants it, then they are gonna have some time to request the data from the data holders, make it available in the secure processing environment. By default, anonymized. If it is requested with a good reason in the, in the request that you need pseudonymized data, then this is a possibility, an exceptional possibility too. So that's in the task and obligation. And of course, there are more tasks and obligation for the organization, that, such as cooperating with each other, you know, helping out and, and all, all that. But these are these articles. Data altruism, uh, that's also a part in health. So that completes the other regulations that we have on data altruism. And the duties of the data holders. As I said, data holders are going to be required to uh, give the data to the health data access bodies. So that's, uh, you have the, oh, yes, sir. no worries. So that's, that was some part. So, so other, so the, the whole point of setting up those organization health data access body is to create a transparent framework to access a uniform framework to, uh, to access data. So that implementation is, is rather 
uh, a uniform, I would say. The other point is that if, uh, if someone, and anybody could request data, any uh, individual or legal person could send a request. Those, uh, if, you send, if you need data from different countries, you, it's enough to send one request. And then those health data access body are gonna cooperate at European level to, to handle that. Uh, so the, the regulation sets also provisions to, uh, for transparent handling of the fees that can be charged to make this data accessible so that it's not the data holders that are gonna carry the cost. It's gonna be the data requesters that are gonna be charged with the cost made to make this data accessible. There are gonna be penal penalties, of course, if you don't comply with the regulation. That's also transparent. Uh, so permits, all, all of this EU structure, so there is, the, there is a mandatory participation from, uh, European, from those European health data access body to an infrastructure that mirrors the primary infrastructure, my health at EU, it's gonna be called health data at EU. So it's this, the European data space, as you said, is, is not just a legal proposal, it's a legal proposal together with an infrastructure together with a governance system and together with, with lots, lots of uh, implementation uh, projects that are gonna be needed to actually digitalize health in the, in the countries. Uh, yeah, and then so part, part of this is gonna be, uh, so this cross-border infrastructure is gonna be to facilitate the cross-border access of, of, of this data and the cross-border handling. Another thing that this infrastructure will, European-wide infrastructure will do, and that's why we need a European-wide, is that there's gonna be a, a data um, catalog of metadata for all the data sources uh, that are in Europe, so that you can search somewhere where, so that people who want to access data can, can look up what data is available where and with what quality. So very important, so that you know upfront that you don't get uh, bad quality data and you're wasting your time you, by doing all this application work. So that's the EU data set catalog. That's a principal uh, schema of, of the infrastructure. So this is to highlight how it, it could look like or it's, how it's gonna look like. So here you have in green the data holders and the data uh, users who are interfacing with the health data access body of their remit of aware of their jurisdiction jurisdiction and then the network is facilitating the, the 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 communication between all those parts part of this network are countries but also uh, infrastructure research infrastructures and european institutions like EMA, like ecdc and of course, we, we, we know from the COVID that this could be very useful, or this will be very useful. There is a, a project that, that, uh, that is under evaluation to, uh, to uh, build up the services and in the yellow boxes. Uh, so it should start in September. And then there's gonna be also a project to, to uh, build up their services in blue, in the blue, the blue services at European level to make the glue to make all of this work. So that's that's going to be going on at the same time as the the negotiation will uh, will take place. Okay, so here you have also measures to for capacity building because of course uh, it's it's a law, it's a proposal, it's infrastructure, but it's also about the capacity of member states. I mean, in the healthcare systems, you will need to have capacity at nurse and doctor level to actually, and IT people in the hospital to actually do that and, and know what, for example, the procurement, what, what should you ask for when you procure systems, which is a, a huge uh, hurdle to interoperability today. Also provision on, on third country and uh, international access. So with these articles, I think I'm, yeah, I'll, I'll do this one too, right? Uh, right now, so, so just to compare really what the difference will be, right now, uh, as, as, uh, as Guillaume said, uh, My Health at EU already exists. It's, it's been set up as part of the cross-border uh, healthcare directive and the participation, the, the governance is, is ruled by the EU Health Network, which is a voluntary network of member states. 
So this is soft cooperation, non-binding. It has achieved great, great results. I mean, this is thanks to these organizations that we had, the UDCC. So we should, we should all be very thankful to, to, to these people who have put their sweat and blood into this. The, the difference with the HDS is that the participation is gonna be compulsory. So that there is, there is a lot more drive in, in the, uh, yeah, how it's going to happen. The, so the, the Article 14 is going to replace the e-health network by the European Health Data Space Board, which is, uh, it's, it's not to remove the e-health network and create something totally different. It's to build up and, and, and really make it more, uh, more sustainable. So that's, that's the point here. There are going to be also groups, of course, comitology, comitology committees and expert groups to participate into the, uh, the uh, implementing acts and the delegated, delegated acts, of which there are a number of to, to set, for example, the guidelines and specifications of all how, how this is going to have to happen and to, uh, to complement the regulation. Two joint controllership groups, one for each net, for, one for each infrastructures, because this sharing of data is is uh, is something new. It's the data is not contained in one hospital. We are sharing data across borders, uh, especially if a patient goes to to Portugal from here to get healthcare, then the data is going to need to flow to the doctor in Portugal. So there is a new situation, and that requires joint controllership to set the provision if what if uh, something happens so okay i mean finally uh, in the uh with the regulation i mean you have after five years there will be an entry of force of the regulation the uh, there will be an ev a targeted evaluation specific evaluation on the certification system after seven years you have the traditional you know uh uh, commission will review the whole thing to see uh, overall evaluation of the regulation, whether it's work and uh, what needs to be done. So that's a traditional uh, thingy. Um, the interesting thing also with entering into force is that basically, especially for the primary part, there's several traditional periods for some of the elements. I mean, we do understand that all not all member states are ready right from, from day one to actually implement these requirements. So there's going to be a stage approach for, for these elements after one and three years from the entry of the application to, to, to take some time for the member state to, uh, to have the, 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 all the system in place to make it work. As I said, I mean, now they're, they're all committed to, uh, to be uh, uh, in the system by 2025. So we do expect to, to be doable uh, in, the, in the future. So what's really the benefit? I mean, to just to, uh, to clearly like a recap of the benefit. I mean, I think for individual, it's really about uh, trust. I mean, you have more better understanding where the data go and flows and everything. You understand, uh, you have better efficient healthcare, avoid unnecessary tests. I mean, it's not like uh, what's your blood result of uh, yes, uh, six months ago, I don't know. Okay, well then now you, you will say we will need to do them again or instead of now it's uh, can you have access to your, to your health data and and uh, we pick it up from your from your file. So that's a really useful uh, element. <coughs> so support medical decision. I mean, basically, you have a, a fuller pictures of the uh, of the um, person health. So avoiding medical error and improve health outcome. <coughs> so for medical for healthcare provider, uh, you have. Um, Hospital expenditure, you reduce the amount of unnecessary uh, unnecessary uh, uh, test and result, and you try you can have better remote care via telemedicine. For a researcher, you and policymaker, you have access to more data. You can have better decision making and research and development. For industry, you have access to again to better data, research, development, and larger market for EHR. Uh, I have a thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. So this is really important, but also we want strong safeguard. So for primary use, we're building on the cybersecurity legislation. We have a security and interoperability criteria for EHR and C market. There will be security uh, audit for my health at EU. There will be strong authentication for patient and health profession to make sure that the people who are connecting are really the people who are supposed to be connecting to the, to the system. And 
there will be limitation also to what they can access to and everything. The secondary use, again, you, you will do it in, you will do the stuff in the secure processing environment, complying with high standards, cyber privacy and cyber security. No personal data can be downloaded from the system. The, uh, this prohibition for the user to try to identify the individual being used within the uh, data provided. And again, there will be audit in the health data at EU. So as I said, we have uh, tried to provide some funding. I mean, very quickly, I mean, there's overall about 800 million funding for the HDS and infrastructure. There's already 330 million earmarked for that. There's complementary funding for, of, of almost 500 million. And also there's funding for national investment to the ERRF or ERDF or Invest EU. I mean, this is, uh, so. Uh, the next steps is who in the uh, with the uh, the proposal. Of course, this is going to be uh, uh, the trilogue is starting with uh, with the Council and the European Parliament. So potentially, very likely that the, the the text will change, the outcome of that will change. So it's not set in stone. I mean, that's what we're proposing. It's quite ambitious, and we hope that it will be uh, uh, what we get at the end. But you always know about that. It may not be the the case. It may go sideways or remain pretty much the same. We don't know. We don't know yet. Uh, we're also going to present it at the H H N meeting on June one and two in Paris. The French and, and German translation will be available on twenty fifth of May, so that pretty soon. Other language will come up uh, pretty soon. There will be presentation to the Council uh, in EPSCO, and we're also uh, working with the EDPS EDPB for their uh, formal opinion about uh, this element in relationship to particularly for data protection. And that's it. And we are open, happy to uh, address the question now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And what I'm taking from both of your presentations is purpose. We shouldn't forget why we are doing that and uh, that this is about patient outcomes in the end. Thank you, Natalie, for reminding us in the introduction. And then the neighbors of that quality, trust, agility, and empowerment, because it might look complex, but it's complex for purpose on, and, and also um, it is part of this building trust and building quality. So thank you very much for that. Just to check if there is any question and we would just take one. I think overwhelming amount of information and people probably read the, the proposal and still try to, to make sense of it. Yes, there is one question. Just speak. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, I have a quick question about um, my health at EU because I understand it's going to be mandatory for member states, um, but then there's a reference to 2025 that you made as well. Um, is it expected that by 2025 substantial progress is made without making it mandatory by 2025? Because I guess countries like, well, we see Germany now struggling a bit with data exchanges at the healthcare level, um, and even Finland, for example, with very good infrastructures, will struggle a bit to make sure that everything can be centralized and exchanged um, with other member states. So what what is that 2025 deadline actually? Well, at the moment, they, there's, there's two things. I mean, um, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's the 2025 is basically a commitment by the member state to to all join the system and to to try to work it out. I mean, uh, the real requirement is really on the uh, regulation saying that you know after one or three years and 2024 you need to have this system being in place and being usable. That's the legal commitment. That, so you have a political commitment, and I think you have a legal commitment. Of course, as I said, also there are funding available. I mean, to 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 help member state to achieve these ambitious goals. And that's also uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, and one of the, also the advantage of having the EHDS board is also for member state, different member states are a different maturity level in the implementation of these, uh, of these uh, requirements. And hopefully we, we, we hope that the, uh, the more advanced member state can help the uh, to, to, you know, trial and error and to the experience saying, you know, don't bother about that, it is going to be, this, 
dead ends and be careful about this thing. We had a lot of problem with that. Or this is going to, to, to happen very quickly. Don't worry too much about that, but don't worry about this. So people can exchange more easily experience and that reduce the also for the uh, latecomers, the, uh, the, the, the amount of time you need to actually to do it because they're not going to be the same mistake as other people. So hopefully by ex learning from experience from others, you can you can uh, uh, enhance and facilitate the uh, the, the thing. So um, that's the uh, really the trying to do. Super. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is another question, Aneta. Yes, I will speak on behalf of the audience that is joining uh, online. So there are actually quite many questions. So I don't think that we will have time to answer all of them. Uh, but there is a lot of questions around the consent. There are questions around data altruism. Uh, also, uh, at which point this data, for example, from clinical trials would have to be shared. But there is also uh, one general question related to how this ambitious proposal would be incorporated and interplay with the other priorities set by the commission let's say even pharma strategy. So whether that can be perceived as an enabler, as a, as a sort of driver for a broader acceptance of reward evidence, and it can basically result in a better quality reward data. So is this something that was also is a, is a part of this proposal? Yeah, so there was several, there were several questions here. So <laughs> if let's say um, <clears throat> about the Oh, about the the pharma and the, um, the the legislative proposal, the the there are going to be there is a review of the regulations. Uh, the pharma regulations are going to happen, and they are going to be on possibly on negotiations at about, about the same time. So, the it is going to be up to the the presidencies there to 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 schedule that in in a way that is constructive for for both, so that we don't do double work or that it is effectively led and. We should be trustful in that. Uh, that's one point. The point about uh, you had a point about consent, right? Uh, so, in the, so uh, there are two 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 sides. The primary use the is a is a reinforcement of the the in the rights of the individual to control their data. That's very important. So that that is. And, uh, and equal rights. So today, so they are, as an individual, you can um, sh share data or stop sharing data, see who is, so I, in that philosophy of consent, it, it's a dramatic improvement with, with what, is, uh, what is today. Well, that's, that's a primary use. Secondary use, research and innovation and policy making and personalized medicine. So today, research and innovation happens already. I mean, we, we, it's not like nothing is happening. There, there, I mean, there are new medicine coming out and medical devices. So it is happening often based on consent, like you're mentioning in clinical trial. Now, the implementation of the consent has been uh, studied and assessed, and it, is, it, it varies widely across Europe, how this is. We, we have all from... Uh, in good safe data systems to, to patient data flowing around on USB keys, to be honest. And, and so this regulation is also a dramatic improvement of the security of the handling of electronic health data, personal data, because the data, when it is requested through the health data access body, it's gonna be contained in those secure processing environments, which are not um, up to uh, every municipality to, to have the competency to set up. Th these are going to be national or, or quasi-national uh, institutions with highest competence and where we have mechanism to share the best practices at European level so that the security of those systems is going to be the highest possible. So this is a containment of the patient uh, electronic health data, which is absolutely not achieved today. So this is dramatic improvement. Now, to request the data is not going to be based on, on consent anymore. So the, the researcher or the company accessing the data is going to need to have a, a legal base to do the, the, that research, and, and that, that could vary. The access by the health data access body to the data holders is going to be the HDS regulation. So 
consent is not the base for EHDS. That said, I mean, consent is still a part of GDPR. So if everybody wants to go for consent and think it's more, it's still possible in theory. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for replying the questions uh, on behalf of the audience as well. I suggest that we now move from theory to practice and uh, look at case studies of what is it that we want EHDS to enable so that we can then have a conversation with the experts about what do we need from the EHDS or the res what best result uh, from the legislative process would actually, uh, we do expect in order to, to to enable all of that. So I would start with Chris, Chris Walker, who is also um, the FPI, the chair of the FPI Digital Health Expert Group and uh, would present us the first case study. Chris. Thanks, Magda. Um, so I'm gonna start with an apology. I realize I'm actually quite tall and I've been in my, the back of my head has been in most of the presentations so far. Um, so I, I should choose where to sit more carefully. Um, then I'm going to start with saying how excited I am. Um, the European health data space has been a long time in discussion, um, and we're really excited that it's um, now here as a proposal. Um, so I, sh I should introduce myself. So morning to all of you, all of you online. Um, my name is Chris Walker. I'm the chair of the Digital Health Working Group. It's an expert group that we have in FPIA. FP is the uh, European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, as I'm sure you all know. Um, why do we have such a group? Well, we have that group because connected data is really important to the future of how we can uh, research, develop, um, and bring forward new medicines. Um, so this announcement um, that we're um, playing with today and that we're starting to see how it might come to life is really gonna enable us to uh, bring more medicines forward. Um, so I'm incredibly excited as, as that chair of that group um, to be here today, make a few introductory remarks, and then explain a little bit about Eden. So Eden is one of the examples we'll talk around. Um, but actually, I'm going to start with a couple of opening remarks just to reflect on a few of the things that have been said so far, maybe talk a little bit about um, EHDS and how we're thinking about it, and then bridge from there to Eden to say, well, here's something we're already sort of starting to do, and how that's an interesting example. So, um, so let's start um, there. So as you see in this first slide and you look to the, um, the left-hand side of it, um, I think we've already mentioned COVID as a kind of an enabler to us thinking about health in a different way. You know, I'm here in person. It's the second business trip I've done in the last two years. Um, you know, we've, we've stopped and we've changed how we're working. Um, health has become a real importance to us and we're really stopping and pausing and thinking about that um, very carefully. When we're looking for medicines to come and um, solve problems that we have, health problems, we want that to be done really quickly. When it's COVID, it feels like more of an emergency. So in an emergency situation, you need everyone to pull together. You have to decide how you're gonna respond. And it's kind of like, it feels like a crisis. So obviously collaboration, connecting bits of data that are otherwise disparate and fragmented is what you need to make that um, happen quickly. That's what happened in COVID. So I think we should be incredibly proud that the systems pull together and they've got us to the point where we could all be in the same room together. You know, the people that are here today in person in Brussels, they're here because we've got vaccines and we've got therapies and those therapies have come from people working together. What you see on the left here is um, how did we do that quickly? Well, we connected data. With a disparate way of having data, that normally takes us two to three years to um, develop medicines, to do things like observational research, where we look at the real world available data, we try and connect them together. In this setting, in COVID, we managed to do that particular step in a matter of weeks rather than a matter of years. So that's the sort of opportunity. So we, we talked a little bit about the billions that this might translate into, but the time that you save in bringing medicines forward you know, that's a real um, opportunity for European citizens. Because that's what we're here for today is to talk about how could we accelerate that? And in connecting data, which is the power that unleashes that, how could we improve that? I'm also really pleased that we chose health as the priority example. Um, and uh, that, that phrase that you use, Laurent, um, of, of why we chose that, I thought was really powerful. Um, one person's data can cure another person. I think was, I'm sort of ad hocing a little bit of the phrase you use, but it, 
that's really powerful, I think. If we can unlock our data to be used for others, that's really the power that we're talking about and why we've sort of gathered together for this sort of discussion. So, as I say, at FPO, we've been talking about this for some while. It's why we formed a group to talk about connected data. Um, we really welcome the uh, European Health um, Data Space proposal by the Commission. We agree it's ambitious, but it's a laudable objective um, to have safe, secure sharing of health data, overcoming those legal and technical barriers. You know, those are the things that could be in our way, but they're the things that we have to solve for together. Um, and I, I certainly applaud them for the framework that they've laid out. You know, we're starting to see today a little bit of the detail of what that looks like. What are those technical pieces, um, almost line by line of the legislation? That's the roadmap of what we need to do together. Um, but I can see the sort of a path forward of how we might um, all pull in the same direction. So each day, uh, you and I are generating data points. Um, you know, I'm wearing an Apple Watch, so I'm creating um, data as we speak about my current heart rate. Um, you know, other, other data is kind of being generated as you go to your doctor's surgery, they might collect data about you. As if you entered into a clinical trial, we gather data. Now that data is a powerful resource, but only if you connect it together. If it sits in those disparate locations, it's a little bit harder for us to um, make use of it. We, we call that data that's not in the clinical setting, real world data. You know, it's the data that's the reality of how we actually experience health in our day-to-day -day lives. But the problem is it can sit in multiple places, um, in separate systems, and sometimes collected in different formats. And for me, that's that interoperability that you heard from the commission talking about. And that's the piece that we've got to solve for. It's the piece that I'll bridge to in a minute when we talk about Eden that says we need some kind of common language, some simple way that we can talk to each other so that it doesn't sit in different places and is only discoverable by different people. It's got to somehow be powerful to everyone. So that's, that's why we want to talk about it. But if we do that, we can intercede with diseases, um, develop new medicines, um, get feedback about how patients respond on a kind of um, live ongoing basis, gather reactions and pull that data so that we can share that with each other, track compliance, even adherence. You know, this powerful of uh, the powerful reason to have data is it, it gives you better insights to make better decisions. So that's that's why um, data is a powerful tool to us. But we've talked a lot about access. So we have to make sure it's generated and captured. Um, so some, some places were still generated in a sort of um, paper format. So it's got to switch to digital. Then it's got to be in a format that um, is accessible. We've got to talk about who should have access to it. And I'm really pleased to see that in the EHDS proposal that um, it's not just um, portability of um, data for patients. We're also talking about portability of um, data and access of data for research organizations, because we already understand that that could be uh, something that's needed. Um, so as you look at uh, what's being said, the piece that you were also touching on was governance. Um, so these kind of central bodies um, that will um, oversee who should have access and what should they have access for, I think that's important. It needs to be simple. It needs to be consistent. I was really pleased to hear that um, as an industry, um, so we represent um, industry, we, we could make maybe one request rather than going to each one individually, because one of the things we worry about is the fragmentation of each member state doing this slightly differently. And if they do it slightly differently and we have to make 27 requests and each request is slightly different and some of them agree it and some of them decline it, that's going to um, impede our ability to um, bring forward the innovation. You know, so that idea of um, cooperation between the member states, driving them to work with each other, I think is a real uh, positive. Um, together, I think we can make a really innovation friendly ecosystem. You know, that sounds like a bit of a buzz, uh, buzzword sort of phrase, but that's what this actually is. It's a network of people working together, stakeholders that care about data and bringing it forward. Um, so we've talked about access. We've talked a little bit about um, standards, but as we bridge the standards and we think more about interoperability, interoperability, interoperability brings quality and content standards. And, and without that, the standards might be different in different bits of the healthcare system. So that's, that's one of the pieces that I want to bridge to next. And as we start thinking about existing principles, there's already um, things that many of you will have heard of, like the FAIR principles, um, that data should be um, findable, accessible, interoperable, usable. You know, those are things that are, we've already been talking about, so that's already there. Um, we don't need it all to be in the one place, in the one pot. 
you know, this federated idea of distributed data is, is quite possible. That's the way the world's going to work now. But we do need it to be able to talk to each other. And that's the reason for common data models. So common data models means a common data language. Um, so CDMs or common data um, models, they essentially help us to organize our real world data um, into a common structure, common format, and across multiple data sources. So I'm not talking at the patient level or the study level. I'm now talking about across multiple studies so that you can look across all of those studies and say, what does that mean collectively? If I want to look at these multiple studies, how, how, how could I um, gain some insights from those? Now, there's currently two common data models that are used quite um, a lot and um, are, are sort of talked a lot about, and that's the US's Sentinel system. So that's uh, one that's used a lot. And the one that we're talking about in Eden is the OMOP system. So what we need to decide, though, is what's the agreed standard that will um, will work towards internationally. Because if we have multiple systems and those interoperability systems don't even talk to each other, then we're into another um, problem. So that we sort of have to be working together, as I say, pulling in the same direction. So as I turn to this slide um, and talk to you a little bit, about, bit more about EDEN. So what does EDEN stand for? So hopefully most of you know and have heard of it, but um, I'll, I'll explain it anyway. So EDEN is uh, the EU Health Data Evidence Network. So again, it's that word network. It's how are we connecting things together? It brings together, and I'll switch to the other slide. Oh. I only have to do that once. We've only got two slides. Um, brings together 23 partners. Um, there's and across 12 countries. So there's um, 11 public partners and 12 FPA member companies. Those companies are putting in 15 million euros and the EU funding is a, a further 14 million. So it's a, a fairly powerful amount of money to, um, to have this ambition. Um, what's it there for? Um, well, the project is, is aiming to accelerate the adoption and utilization of the OMOP common, common data model. But why is it looking to do that? Um, well, from my perspective, what it's really there for is it's um, ultimately trying to support the development of an infrastructure that allows us um, to reduce the time to answer these real world health research questions. So you see that at the top left as the, why, why is this thing um, here? Why do we need it? How will it go about that? Well, that picture that you see that's a sort of schematic on the right hand side of the slide shows multiple data sources you know, millions of patient records that are being generated all the time, an agreed standard, so that interoperability interface, and then standardization of analytics. So how will we, in a routine, systematic way, look at that data? And hopefully that will lead us to a, a better answer. So you have more data coming together and better solutions. So already there's um, 20 IMI projects that use this um, standard. Um, so when we're saying this, this sounds like something we're going to do in the future, this is something we're actually already doing now. And it's because people have recognized the importance of the common data language as something that we've really got to get right. So we as FPA want to be part of this conversation because we've been involved in this already. We want to continue to be part of um, trying to help these decisions as we're trying to choose which common data model is the right one, whether it's OMOP or another one. We, we want to be part of that discussion too. We've got lots of thoughts and comments as you already started to hear from Aneta um, around the um, EHDS proposal. You know, we're really excited about that and how that might fit together. But hopefully what you've started to hear in my um, short presentation, just with a, a few minutes, um, A, we're very excited about EHDS. We're really excited about the potential of connection. Um, you see live example already from Eden of how this is already starting to take shape and is working. Um, and we're really looking forward to the next steps of how this might uh, come about. So that's just a little um, tee up from us as a case study, but we're looking forward to more conversation today. Thank you very much, Chris. And that just shows us what we want to enhance through the EHDS and um, uh, the, the powerful example that you gave about what we do usually in three years we could do in 
two weeks and within three weeks submit the data to the regulators. And I think that's really a powerful example. So that's what we want to enhance. Another example also coming from IMI and not surprisingly, because you need public, private and multi-stakeholder collaboration in order to test and implement such complex systems, it's C4C. And let's see if our um, system, a hybrid system works. We should have with us uh, Claudia Pansieri from the C4C project to do her presentation. Claudia, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Let me share the screen. Okay. Can you can you see my screen? I think you it's, it's good. Okay, can you hear me? Can you show? Can you show the screen? The presentation. We can hear you, but you need to switch the the way you show. This one is okay right. for you. Perfect. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. And in my presentation, I will shift the attention in uh, um, in the pediatric field and uh, in uh, especially in the sharing of uh, um, clinical trials data and in the reuse of uh, this uh, this kind of um, this kind of data. Um, let me uh, explain a little bit what is uh, Connect for Children. Connect for Children is a project then that aims to building a pan-European clinical trials network to deliver high-quality regulatory grade clinical trials to multiple countries, sites, and in all the pediatric age groups. Uh, as in CVBF, we are actively involved within the World Package 5 in uh, that coordination center and the co data quality standards. The main objective of uh, this work, this group is to create system tools and standards to enhance, to enhance the quality, the utility and the reusability of this data collected during the pediatric clinical trials. Okay, sorry. Okay, in, uh, uh, in the framework of uh, the WP5, what we did, uh, there was, uh, first of all, a scouting of uh, all the initiatives uh, that uh, um, are currently active in, uh, in the panorama uh, for developing electronic archiving program that store and uh, reuse clinical trial data in a pediatric context. And what we have found uh, during this, uh, this scouting uh, that, uh, that there are currently exist 20 platform or repositories that collect this kind of data. Uh, these uh, repositories are main, mainly uh, funded by public, uh, public fund. And also uh, there is a very, very small part that is uh, uh, that have a private public collaboration partnership that uh, they are mainly located in uh, the United States and only three of them are located in uh, Europe. Uh, within these uh, uh, 20 repositories that uh, we have found, uh, the availability of pediatric clinical trials, however, is available only in the 60% of these. Um, what we can say also about uh, the, these repositories is that uh, they have mainly uh, be founded from 2000. And uh, uh, the, the most recent, uh, the youngest repositories that we have found was founded in 2021. And uh, uh, if uh, we want to talk about uh, the therapeutic area that, uh, uh, cover, that is covered by these uh, repositories, we can say that uh, uh, they cover, they collect data from a very large um, type of uh, uh, therapeutic area, so mainly they, they have not, they are not dedicated to, to one uh, topic. Uh, also, uh, also is uh, strongly recommended uh, to share 
clinical trials data from the regulation and uh, also from uh, uh, academics and uh, uh, journals. Only a few initiatives uh, for sharing clinical trial data in pediatric field still exist. And our extension was more focused also in the reuse of this kind of data. Um, what we did uh, in, uh, we recently submitted the um, protocol in Zenodo, in which we explain where uh, our uh, analysis. Um, but the question is why is it important to reuse data and why it's important to reuse data in uh, of pediatrics, of pediatric clinical trials. And uh, there are three main reasons. The first were a scientific, scientific reason, an ethical reason, and an economic reason. Uh, for a, from a scientific point of view, because uh, if you ha have the possibility to have uh, all the data uh, available from clinical trials, so we can formulate new hypotheses. And also data could be used to replicate analysis. And also because not sharing is wasteful and uh, could result in missed opportunity to advance uh, the knowledge, the general knowledge about uh, uh, this topic. And also data from multiple studies can be aggregated and this is essential for rare diseases. We have also an ethical reason for sharing data, the respect for uh, trial participants, for uh, patients that are gifting their bodies and uh, uh, their data for the reason, for the re reusing uh, this commitment from patients, in deterring inaccurate reporting of trials results. At least uh, we have also an economic advantage for uh, the reuse of data. And uh, data can be, since uh, data can be seen as a new form of capital for research and the knowledge based community. And uh, also because if data is reused, it maximizes the value of the regional research investment. We, it can also facilitate entrepreneurship and better trial design that we came in, uh, that will reduce the number of trials that will fail. Now uh, I will share, show you two uh, case studies. Uh, the first uh, was uh, the case of uh, the etel plier sen for uh, the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. In uh, these studies, uh, this author, what uh, we did, uh, what they did, uh, they analyzed the results of previous studies to assess the safety and the efficacy of the ether blisten. In, uh, um, okay, and what, uh, what they found, they found four clinical studies and they perform a pooled analysis using the data relating to the percentage of dystrophin positive fever obtained from muscle biopsy and the six minute work test. Uh, at the end, the pool analysis was made for uh, 38 patients that uh, were treated with uh, eterplistin. The result of uh, this pool analysis, pool analysis was uh, um, at the end not really statistically significant. However, it uh, show the possibility that these drugs in uh, uh, results in a lower rate of uh, decline in ambulation. And uh, so the author proposed that this uh, uh, currently outweigh the argument against the approval of uh, uh, interpleasant. Uh, what uh, what say this, this uh, at the end that uh, this research added further evidence to the controversy around uh, the approval from the FDA in 2016 of the and uh, the HEMA confirmed the refusal of the market authorization in 2018. Another important, important example is uh, the deferaxinox in uh, always in pediatric patients. The deferaxinox uh, is an oral, oral chelator 
that can be prescribed in uh, pediatric transfusion at the patients that have uh, thalassemia. And uh, these studies uh, what uh, investigate the effect of uh, the dephalaxinos in the, in the kidney function. Uh, in these studies, this was a case control studies that were performed using full data from 10 clinical studies. The transfusion dependent patients with thalassemia aged from 2 to 15 years were identified, identified and uh, all the cases of acute uh, kidney injuries uh, were recorded. Among uh, 1,213 deferazinox treated patients, uh, 162 of uh, acute kidney injuries uh, were identified and recorded. And uh, it was observed that uh, there was an increased case of ACI for uh, in uh, patients treated with five milligrams kilo per day. The conclusion was that uh, the pharaxinos can cause ACI in a dose-dependent manner. So uh, this is a really uh, this is a good information for the physician, since uh, the, the, to do uh, closely monitorally monitor real function and the serum ferritin, since uh, uh, it is uh, the the ACI is. Uh, really those dependent. What uh, we can uh, uh, say about the barriers, barriers for health data sharing. In uh, what we have understood in uh, these studies uh, is that uh, there are uh, really regulatory issues uh, as it is uh, it also today, it is not mandatory to share data from clinical trials that to not bring to positive results. And so these, uh, these uh, studies are uh, uh, not findable. And uh, for this reason, uh, that they are not uh, open for uh, the research community. And also, uh, we, there is a low knowledge on how to build a database that is uh, in line with the FAIR principle and how to get access to this kind of data and uh, how, to can, how you can reuse this kind of data. There is also a gap in the harmonization and the standardization of the data that are collected in the different repository and in the different uh, platform. And so there is uh, not the possibility to, uh, that the system can uh, talk, uh, that they can speak uh, one with each other. And uh, at the end, there is also an economic issues that influence the willingness of the sponsor to share data based on their uh, specific product development strategies. And uh, so the principle uh, that uh, also the speaker before me told about the fear of uh, the verification of uh, data, it is uh, um, one of the points that uh, should be addressed for, uh, for the sharing, for uh, the big sharing of uh, clinical trial data also in a pediatric field. Thank you for the attention. For uh, more information, uh, you have uh, my details. Thank you very much, Claudia. Very good examples, and I think illustrate very nicely how data help individual patients that give them, but how data also cure other patients, as, as was said before. So very, very good illustration. So let's continue the conversation now around what do we want the EHDS to enhance and how do we get there? And I would like to invite our panelists now, and we have three panelists online and three panelists in the room. Um, so I would like to invite, uh, uh, who is in the room? We have um, Shona Cosgrove from TIDES. We have uh, Gus de Briggs from Data Saves Lives and EPF. And we have, let's see me if I can do that correctly, Giedrek Fedaravicene. Uh, thank you from Cos here, uh, a little concours between us. And online we have Peter Arlet uh, from EMA, Hans Hedegaard from the Danish Health Data Authority, 
and um, Professor James Ndo, urologist uh, from the European Association of Urology. And uh, what I would like us now is to, to do is to have a conversation about what is it that you want EHDS to enhance and what would you like EHDS therefore to do for achieving that and what do we need to do collectively in order to achieve that purpose? And let's start maybe with those online because we always um, uh, get them last and starting maybe with Peter Arlet and each of you in turn, two minutes of your vision of what you want EHDS to enhance and how do you want to get there? And then we start the conversation, Peter. So thanks very much and thanks for the opportunity to take part as a, as a medicines regulator. So as a medicines regulator, we uh, support the development of medicines by the pharmaceutical industry and academia. We then authorize medicines uh, to be marketed and then we oversee their safe and effective use on the product through uh, surveillance. Um, we see great opportunity um, in the secondary use of healthcare data to support all steps in the regulatory process. And we believe that the European health data space, uh, when established, uh, will significantly enhance um, our ability to access and analyze healthcare data to support decision making for, um, therefore, supporting innovation and better patient health. Um, we believe we, we have in the European Regulatory Network a program of work in place to help us leverage healthcare data. That includes work on um, data quality, work on data accessibility, so the find of, of FAIR, um, work to establish a, a, a network of uh, data in the context of medicines regulation, and that's um, referred to as Darwin. And very specifically on Darwin, this is a distributed network where uh, data stay local, um, so data protection by design, if you like. Um, we believe by the end of 2022, 20, uh, we will have at least 10 data partners already onboarded, and we will have studies delivering results for regulatory decision making to support better decisions on um, the authorization and supervision of medicines. Um, maybe just a comment uh, to build on Chris Walker's presentation. Um, we at the European Medicines Agency also strongly support a standardization of data formats, so the use of a common data model. Um, many people in the audience will know that we have, uh, um, with our awarding of the Coordination Centre for the Darwin Real World Evidence Network, we have um, uh, awarded the contract to uh, Erasmus Medical Centre in Rotterdam. Um, largely because of their extensive experience of using a common data model. Why do I mention this? Because I believe that um, the public and the private sector will need to continue to support um, converting data sets into a common data model, and that support will need to be done long term. So I just take the opportunity of this forum, because we've got the public and the private sector in the room, thinking of future icky calls, perhaps. Uh, we need to see investment in conversion of data into a common data model long term. So um, really welcome the European health data space. We believe the health data space will increase the breadth and the depth of data available um, to support decision making. We are committed to helping to build the health data space through piloting, sharing expertise, sharing um, our um, ex experience of running studies. Um, and yeah, we're ready to roll up our sleeves and get on with the task of building right now. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. We are certainly going to come back to you, uh, no doubt. But let's now turn to um, Hans Hedegaard from the Danish Health Data Authority. How does EHDS look from your perspective? Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the possibility to be here to talk. I think I can talk as, uh, as a representative of a government agency that actually provides data to the European health data space. So I'm not a data user, I'm a data provider. Uh, a, a short introduction to the to the Danish Health Data Authority. We are a national government agency under the Danish Ministry of Health, and one of our main tasks is to collect data from our healthcare system and store them into uh, national health registries. And then we provide access to these data for secondary use uh, in uh, in our secure research environment, uh, so that we enable efficient use of Danish health data. Um, so 
from our perspective, the, the European health data space is a is an important a step to address some of the challenges, some of the issues there is in terms of actually getting getting better use of all the health data we have uh, across the European Union and starting in a common way and in a collaborative way actually to addressing some of these issue as Peter mentioned before and as Eden mentioned for example the whole issue of data standardization the OMOP for example using this this is an important task that we have to agree upon that we have to find common ground and I, I see the ESDS as a as a vehicle and as a as a as a common project that that actually can enable this so so that would be my uh, I think my perspective in into it. I think it's 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 highly relevant. Uh, it's extremely important to to work on this in the European level, but also to see from from the perspective of each country. We we have to find the common models on how we are going to do this. Uh, and from that perspective, I hope also I can bring forward some of the Danish experiences. We have some we have a good system basically in Denmark for providing access to data, and I hope maybe that could be a showcase for other countries as well. And that is also an ambition on being here today, for example. Thank you so much. So going forward now um, to the healthcare professionals, clinicians and doctors, uh, Professor Ndomi, can I, can I give you the floor now, your perspective on EHDS? Yes, good afternoon to you all. Um, I'm really excited to be here is the first thing to say. Really excited to see the progress that has been made with the EHDS. Um, I am Adjunct Secretary General at the European Association of Urology. We have 19,000 surgeon members. Um, I, I, and I'm also fortunate to be the academic coordinator of two IMI funded big data projects, one on Pioneer prostate cancer, one called Optima now on prostate cancer, breast cancer, and lung cancer. Now, wearing my hat as a professional, healthcare professional and a researcher, um, we our job in the front line is to to improve the out outcomes of patients. This is why we are doctors finally. And so, of course, as a, as a society, professional medical society, we have 19,000 surgeon members. Their job is to improve the care of patients. Now, it's really difficult when you're looking at the whole EU um, uh, landscape to be able to coordinate how we care for patients. We use guidelines to do so, to harmonize care, and we produce guidelines that are now endorsed across 75 countries. But there is a real, real challenge for us as guideline, uh, clinical practice guideline producers. What, what is this challenge? The challenge is that 90% of published evidence every year is not fit for purpose, right? To improve, to, to change our, our clinical practice recommendations. Can you imagine 90% of what we look at every year cannot, they're not fit for purpose. Right, So we have a lot of recommendations that are not underpinned by high quality um, clinical trials, randomized clinical trials. And so we've had to turn to real world data, right? Because there is actually complementarity between clinical trials and of course, uh, real world data. Clinical trials do not invariably address other populations like the elderly, like um, obese patients, like patients with comorbidities or multiple drug therapies. So we as a society have now embarked on not only ensuring we improve the quality of published evidence, but also include how we understand better real world data um, through projects like Pioneer and Optima, but the critical thing for us that, um, of course, Chris Walker mentioned earlier, and uh, uh, Peter has also mentioned, is around how we harmonize data, a common data model that we all agree on, so that you know, data from Denmark, data from Scotland, data from Albania can all be harmonized in a sensible way to improve patient-centered care that is evidence-based, cost-effective, data-driven towards a value-based healthcare. Uh, process. So for us, we're really excited to see the EHDS. What we what we would like to understand more is, of course, is how we leverage um, uh, what the EHDS plans to do and how EHDS can leverage what we have been trying to do, not only as professional medical societies, but also in terms of projects that are EU funded, like Pioneer and Optima in real world data space that we are in. So really excited to be here and looking forward to participating in the conversations for the rest of the, the morning or the afternoon for you. Thank you so much. Shona, can I, can I turn to you? And uh, you've been part of the joint action towards uh, EHDS. So what lessons learned? Yeah, 
Thank you, Magda. Um, yeah, I was going to say I think I bring a bit of a different perspective than the other than the other panelists, not being a data user or provider, but working for Terra. So yeah, as you said, it's the European the joint action towards the European health data space. And what we do is we really uh, we're twenty five member states who who are supporting the and developing the concepts for the secondary use of health data. So. Um, I suppose when you ask what's our perspective on the EHGS, I mean, we're, we're trying to help build it um, and also building on the variability between the different countries that we see. So me personally, I've been involved with my colleagues in a piece of work where we're visiting different countries. Uh, so we're visiting 12 countries over the next year. And what we're trying to do there is really map what's happening in different countries so that, that can be considered when we build the EHGS to make sure that it is building on what's, what's already there and also realistic and, and answering the country's needs. Thank you. And again, we are going to come back to this uh, technology readiness in countries and how this can be supported. Um, let's turn to Gusta, to you. Uh, data saves lives. Data definitely saves lives. Thank you, Magda. Yes, definitely. I represent today um, not only Data Saves Lives, of course, European Patients Forum as well. Listening to all the discussions of today, actually, we're realizing we're all on the same page. We're expecting the same thing. So it's very exciting for EPF and Data Saves Lives community, and we're really welcoming the European health data space. We're very excited about the development. We just like to make sure from the beginning, the whole process, patient communities are involved. Of course, we keep on saying the same thing maybe, but it's very important and it's fundamental also for them to be engaged, um, but um, with real value in it. So not to be there just because they need to be there, also be able to contribute. So understand already the concepts today we're talking about. Uh, they need to be able to understand those concepts so they would be able to ask questions or contribute valuable contributions from the communities. Because in essence, we believe patient communities are the channels to the citizens at the national levels because they speak the languages they know the, the systems and regulations. So they are the right channels. So to be able to reach out to citizens and gain trust and transfer the transparency, uh, it's very crucial to involve the patient communities from the beginning of, of the developments of the European health data space. Thank you. And last but not least, Gedre. Thank you very much. And uh, indeed, it was a great pleasure today to listen to um, all the presentations and uh, and also all for feedback and comments. And uh, as a pre representative of uh, COSIR, which is uh, medical devices covering uh, probably all possible areas, right, the tools of data aggregation and, uh, and data collection, that is uh, radiotherapy, imaging, ICT, and uh, electromedical devices, um, I would probably say that we could put it into two stage stages. So the first one, uh, the European health data space, as it was said already, we are on one page and uh, it's really nice that in probably in this particular case, even though we are creating a particular completely new thing, uh, which was not present here before, but we are building up on uh, already existing uh, needs, existing uh, supply and uh, existing, uh, you know, common understanding, uh, which, uh, which creates a huge potential that we will uh, find a workable legislation, which really helps uh, everyone and connects the stakeholders. So from a legislation perspective, I would say there are three things uh, that we really need to achieve. So the first one is clarity, clarity of definitions, clarity of roles, uh, so that we have, uh, you know, one understanding, one interpretation across the, not only across the nations, but across the stakeholders as well. And the other two things uh, would be value, Again, to be very specific of what we call value, how we measure value, and how we agree upon that, uh, because that defines the pathways of expectations, that defines the pathways of uh, uh, business plans, uh, national you know, healthcare systems, fin financings, and other things like that. And the third one, which uh, we come to naturally, is the cost. So whatever we do and uh, whatever goals we are aiming, we always have to measure, you know, if it's in balance, the value and the costs uh, that will bring. Uh, 
So when we talk about risks and uncertainties, again, we have to be able to operate on, uh, on those three elements of clarity, comprehension of value and understanding of true costs, which will be passed one another way and, uh, and you know, impact the result, impact uh, the same thing, which I'm hoping we will be discussing today, this, uh, you know, international competitiveness, being uh, capable to really, truly uh, create efficient EU market. But then uh, after the legislation is agreed upon and passed on, uh, I would say the most important part will start to happen, and that is implementation. And in the implementation stage, capacity and capability of all the stakeholders to really cooperate in an orchestrated manner uh, that will be of critical importance. And I really hope that uh, all the bodies which um, are plan to be established by European health data space will also have it as a natural backbone in their operations to make sure that uh, the interests of different stakeholders are aligned and that they are given uh, you know, an opportunity to cooperate all the time in whatever the questions uh, you know, are on the table for discussion. Thank you so much. There are so many things that came up um, in uh, these conversations. I think all messages also to the Commission still present in the room, but um, the few points that I picked up and I would like to throw them back at, um, at colleagues. I heard about misalignment or risk of misalignment of decision making between countries. I heard about uh, standardization and uh, 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 harmonization of data. I heard about interplay between the different legislations. I heard that from the Commission. Nobody from the panelists have mentioned that, but uh, maybe something also to look at in terms of clarity, isn't it? Um, we talked also about um, uh, GDPR and, uh, and things like that. So I would like now to really start the conversation about uh, let's not lose the purpose of sight. What is it that you wouldn't like uh, be the result of the EHDS uh, legislative discussion? What do we want to avoid? What is your concern? The draft legislation as it seems to be welcomed and all its content, but the legislative process only starts. So what are the warning and red flags that we should um, be aware of when going into the legislative process? Who would like to start with that? Yeah, yeah, Okay, so um, uh, yes, definitely, as you said, uh, uh, alignment of uh, legislation with existing framework, and it was very well illustrated, you know, in the presentation that European health data space arrives in already uh, pretty rich context of uh, existing legislations. And uh, let's be honest and open here, you know, the current ones already are giving some uh, headaches, not only solutions. Uh, so for example, the in, in interpretation of GDPR application and uh, even uh, going further, as you mentioned, uh, you know, this introduction of personal and non-personal data, without going into details, you, you would kind of hope that it improves and provides more explanation. However, it is not truly the case, at least for now. So uh, what we would not like uh, to, to happen is uh, to have uh, European health data space adding up complexity. So if in other cases, building up is a good thing to do. So we do hope that um, European health data space will be able to really achieve uh, precision in uh, minimizing the overlaps between existing uh, legislations applicable to different stakeholders who are who are and will be operating under European health data space. And uh, uh, again, as I said, probably this uh, dialogue and uh, really inclusion of uh, the different perspectives uh, is very important because. Uh, all the different stakeholders, they have uh, different, uh, first of all, they have different barriers for the time being already that they have to overcome. So how to align those. And then this risk perception uh, taken from different standpoints uh, may carry different uh, uh, understanding of it and different association of uh, cost of risk. So this will lead to uh, different understanding of uh, you know, what kind of solutions are really needed. So for example, from uh, 
from uh, medical devices manufacturers perspectives for us uh, and that was not a coincidence why i mentioned the word clarity you know we do want uh, to have uh, very clear specific guidance on what kind of data you know is obliged to be provided what kind of data is uh, you can not to provide and that's not only for manufacturers but same as for example for patients and also um, allocation of uh, liabilities and responsibilities so as a medical device uh, device manufacturers you know we let's say have our responsibilities but then when you speak to doctors uh, they often have uh, different fears about uh, you know for example this uh, patient's right to withdraw data uh, then they would have to prove uh, the quality of the treatments provided. So there are a lot of uh, technical things which are very interesting, but uh, for responsible participants of European health data space, you truly need to know uh, a lot of uh, things before you start to apply uh, European health data space with confidence. And I guess that's uh, achieving this confidence uh, is also a step forward uh, towards this trust building, which was often uh, mentioned uh, today. So I do hope that the legislation process will be a lot about uh, discussing the practical aspects and practical worries of the stakeholders uh, to make sure that uh, we get the right wording in the legislation itself. Thank you. Who else wants to comment on that? Shona? Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to, I noticed that you were talking about uh, the different interpretations of the GDPR and how we can align those. And so it just reminded me of that in TEDAS, we did a piece of work where we were looking at the barriers to the secondary use of health data and how they're experienced um, across different data users. And that was, of course, one that came up a lot. Um, and definitely there is a need for more guidance, but also we thought apart from guidance, if we improve collaboration, for example, if we establish a, a platform where legal officers or privacy officers can collaborate and exchange best practices to kind of uh, harmonize, let's say, interpretation in that way, rather than just through guidance. That was one idea that came a lot. And even through our country visits, it was something that was called for. I think there's already an example of such a platform in Belgium. Um, and so if we could uh, extend that platform throughout Europe, that was just one idea that I wanted to, to put out there. And another good practice example was Denmark, of course, and, and mentioned today. So I don't know, Hans, would you like to comment on this? Uh, specific in, in terms of regulation or in more general? Uh... I think in terms, in terms of, yes, um, EHDS and Denmark being at the forefront, what would you like EHDS to enhance? And also what are the worries potentially from country perspective? Um... I think, as, as I said uh, in my introduction, I, in general, I think we, at least at least if you look at the Nordic countries, for example, we have, we have quite advanced models for providing data within our own countries. But for example, in terms of, uh, you could say rare diseases and, and other areas, there is a, a possibility or a need for, um, for more collaboration and to, to actually find these, these models, for example. That is, that is one of the areas we can see that we hope that, that the European health data space can can adv advance research, can advance innovation, and so forth. Um, I think it, from a country perspective, I think if you look at Denmark, both in terms of you could say the the focus on primary care, the my health at EU, and on the secondary use of, of health data, and the whole federated network of EHDS nodes, and and the different perspectives that that is in the in the proposal. Uh, I think that the most important part is to 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 remember that each member state has to to develop some infrastructure within the country, and then we have to develop common infrastructures across Europe as well, in in order to underpin uh, the ambitions in uh, in the in the legislation and in the the proposal of the European health data space. Uh, we have uh, so we have I would say quite a few part of it already in Denmark, and and from our experience, it takes time. It takes resources uh, and it takes a lot of energy in the healthcare system actually succeeding setting these systems up. So I think the, the gradual approach uh, is really important from the from the European health data space. Uh, the need to prioritize which which problem do we want to solve and which problems do we want to solve. Firstly, I think we need to have a discussion and we need to take that discussion with the onset of the data users, for example, what are the problems they are experiencing. 
Uh, and we need to also bear in mind that uh, these IT systems, they're not cheap. Uh, it, it takes, it takes, uh, it, it puts a, a strict measure on our finances as well. So I think that is from, from at least from my perspective of an authority that has to deliver into the European health data space. Uh, that is some of our concerns. And uh, what I heard from the presentation from the commission, I think there is also a, an acknowledgement of this. So I was really glad to hear that as well. Uh, I hope that that answers uh, part of, of your question. It definitely does. And uh, before giving the floor also to the other stakeholders who want to be brought into the system, the patients, the clinicians, the doctors, um, I'd like to go back maybe for a second to Peter because uh, the Darwin and EMA work, it's also already happening. It's something that needs to be, and, and the imperatives of the systems you build need to be considered in the future. So any, any thoughts about what you would like to enhance or avoid through the legislation? Well, um, thanks for the question. I, uh, on behalf of the regulators, see opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. So, I mean, you've you phrased your question about uh, about um, um, problems, potential problems, but we hugely welcome this legal proposal. Um, in its development and in its implementation, we do need to remain focused, however, on benefits and on creating opportunities uh, for health and for innovation, rather than having a purely compliance mindset. Um, so I think um, one way we can do that and remain focused on benefits um, for society is to do it in a joined up way. Um, I know it's often said, but it's in our experience in the area of healthcare data, more true, I think, than in almost any other area I've worked in, that we need to do this together in a multi-stakeholder way. And we need to leverage the best that different stakeholders can bring and not try and do it um, in silos as a regulator or industry or, or patient groups. I think we also need to have a um, program management, a change management approach here. So I'm sure um, some people will be thinking about a legislative proposal. The TED, TEDAS colleagues uh, may be thinking about um, technical guidance. Um, but I think if we, if we take three steps backwards, we need to see that this is delivering a profound change um, in the European landscape for health. Um, and in order to do that, we need to have education, training, outreach, uh, a change management approach. And all of that requires resourcing. Um, so that would be an enabler that I would want to, into, uh, to highlight. You mentioned, uh, Magda, um, interplay between different legislation. In, in my discussions with the European Commission colleagues, I'm talking about the interface with the pharma legislation and the pharma strategy. Um, the European health data space can be seen as an enabler, um, but accessing data, and it was emphasized a number of times by Guillaume in his presentation, the, the secondary use of healthcare data requires a really clear legal basis, and then things should go smoothly. That's the kind of principle in the European health data space. So I would argue that we have an implicit legal basis for secondary use of healthcare data in our legislation. We've now just been given an explicit legal basis in the context of the new mandate in um, uh, health crisis preparedness and response. But we should probably strengthen that even further for medicines regulators to make sure there is absolutely no doubt that we have a platinum level <laughs> legal basis for, um, uh, for accessing and analyzing healthcare data to support regulatory decision-making. Um, in terms of Darwin specifically, and I'll be very brief, um, uh, what have we done already or are doing? I say Darwin, it, real world evidence as medicines regulators, maybe I've broadened it. Firstly, we've mentioned the common data model. We believe that is an enabler um, and uh, data standardization more generally. Um, we have been exploring use cases for secondary use of healthcare data, and we've actually been working with all of our committees, um, be they the Committee on Orphan Medicines to look at uh, disease prevalence, be it uh, the Paediatric Committee to look at uh, unmet medical needs in children, be it our, our licensing committee, the CHMP, to look at uh, contextualizing clinical trial results, and of course, looking at um, safety of medicines uh, with our, our farm proficiency and risk assessment committee. And by having that use case approach, we have done pilots and we have demonstrated that secondary use of healthcare data supports better decision making. Maybe just to loop back to the COVID-19 pandemic, which was prominent in the early presentations, um, we have, as medicines regulators, 
uh, based our regulatory decisions on real world evidence at each step in the development of, of medicines and vaccines. So you'll be, some of you will be well aware of the of safety issues that were resolved and sorted out like thrombosis, like myocarditis, using real world evidence in safety studies. We've done vaccine effectiveness studies and that's been supporting decisions, for example, on booster dosing. Um, we've been doing disease epidemiology to understand um, the role of thrombosis in COVID-19 as a disease. And we've also been looking, doing drug utilization to look how medicines are used in COVID-19 to help contextualize um, drugs uh, and vaccines uh, being developed. So um, all of that is really the living proof that will support the technical and the scientific delivery of, of the European health data space. And I come back to where I started, we need it to do it together with a, a benefits focus. Thank you. Thank you. Together and benefit, I think, are the two key words to us uh, today. So how do we make sure that we don't lose anyone from this um, uh, discussion and conversation? Gözde, do you want to comment? Yeah, leave no one behind and kind of every voice heard. Uh, I think at the legislation level, the things will be there and they will be adapted somehow. They have to be strict enough so that uh, they they, they protect the, the individuals, but they have to be flexible enough as well that can be adapted in the national level. So it's, it's easier said than done probably, but I think altogether co-creation will make it possible because as we all know, this has to be done in a process. It cannot be done today and the results will be perfect tomorrow. Um, just the voice of the patient community, actually, as European Patients Forum, we could very well say we're here and we're here to support the, all the discussions that, the, that will take place and happy to contribute as much as we can from our capacity. Thank you. And I think everybody is saying exactly the same thing. We are here. We are here to co-create. We are here to help to make the system good. I'd like to turn to, to James and how do we bring on board clinicians and researchers on the ground? Because without them and, uh, and their active participation, uh, the system will maybe not deliver us as good as it could. You're absolutely right. And our fixation in the European Association of Urology and indeed in Biomed Alliance is to ensure that this is not an academic exercise, right? We don't want this to become some academic exercise, some IT challenge that one fixes. This needs to exist where it matters the most, and that is to transform the lives of patients and their families back to what they were before it was interrupted by illness or disease, or to help them to cope um, with chronic illness long-term. This is why we, we are having uh, an EHDS, right? To, to ensure that we can demonstrate benefit to the lives of patients. So how do we do that? We need to make sure that we, we value patients and their views and to make sure that patients and healthcare professionals are involved at the European level boards to ensure that this is not just tokenism, right? We don't want it to be tokenism. We want it to be real engagement, facing the challenges for patients and their families. But in general, I, I, I think we've got also challenges along the way, right? That, uh, uh, yes, the challenges, but they can be fixed. I think real world data and real world data analytics is a big leap for researchers that are used to traditional evidence uh, synthesis or clinical trials and things like that. For us in the EAU, this has been a real journey. We've had to, to, to train and build capacity of our own young academic surgeons to understand the benefits and how to use real world data analytics and how we incorporate that alongside traditional published clinical trials in making recommendations for practice. This takes time, takes money, takes investment, but also real education, a real education to people to say GDPR and all these legal frameworks are not there to stop you sharing data. They are actually there to encourage you to share data and to give you confidence that it's safe to share data. And there are safe ways to do it, not to say we use it to stop sharing data. This has been certainly our experience with Pioneer and so far Optima just starting that actually there, there's a lot of lack of knowledge of not only the importance of sharing data, 
but also the fact that it is right to do so. And actually, if we don't do so, there is a real, real penalty in terms of lives impacted in the longer term. And this is something that we as a society cannot allow to go on. So we are really excited about this collaboration, but we have learned some painful lessons in the European Association of Urology in the past four or five years. And we'll be very happy to share that with EHDS as and when needed. Thank you, Magda. Thank you. I think all we say is that implementation starts from now and not only at the point where the legislation is adopted and it's the responsibility of everyone to do that together. There is one question that wasn't asked yet and it is um, EHDS is European health data space yet research and health is not just about Europe. So any perspective on the, on the interplay and the, with the global nature of research and health delivery and EHDS as an instrument? Anyone wants to comment? Gedra? Uh, yes, sorry, I'm super active today, maybe because we are indeed uh, very excited about uh, this whole European health data space and, uh, and, and really want uh, to make sure that it fosters the innovation and it really pulls you know, this uh, capacity. So from what was said, uh, Today, as uh, as an example, how COVID uh, has proved, uh, you know, that we can pull some data and and really deliver huge value to millions of people. I think my microphone probably it goes okay. Uh, in weeks, uh, you know, under the conditions of crisis. So the big question is how to. Uh, to make it work when it's not crisis, to make it a regular uh, thing, which um, uh, which helps us uh, to, to 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 extract that value, which is down there, and uh, and I believe that uh, European health data space, as I said, it's uh, something which is organically, you know, developing uh, within the process. This uh, this need is inside the EU member states that. We do need to do that, both for the benefit of uh, our citizens to really deliver, uh, ensure access to highest uh, quality healthcare, equal access, uh, you know, irrespective of diversity and uh, a lot of other things uh, to enable that true healthcare. Um, but it's also very important, you know, to to ensure that it becomes a base to foster further innovativeness of Europe to be able to attract. Uh, brightest minds to attract uh, global investments to Europe and, uh, and develop, uh, you know, uh, further steps, further sources, not, not only in healthcare or biotechnologies or, or devices, but uh, as we saw, you know, healthcare is one of, uh, what, nine systems, right, of uh, data spaces. And we do know that uh, innovation fosters innovation. So we do need to think about that uh, when also thinking about European health data space, how it can benefit, uh, you know, those spillovers, not only in healthcare again, uh, but also to other sectors and, and, and take those examples uh, of cooperation, of success stories, uh, of trust uh, and inclusion and I, I believe that uh, probably the nicest things about uh, at least digital technology is that it's up until now the best way to include everyone. And uh, when you look at uh, data for uh, mobile phones or mobile access in uh, developing countries, it's amazing. You know, they, they, they don't have a lot of basic things, but they already have uh, technologies, digital technologies, which uh, can be this uh, fast track for them. Uh, to develop. So yes, Europe has a lot of opportunities. Europe has also responsibilities, as it's often said, you know, this, these European values. So uh, the big exercise for all of us is how we can deliver, uh, protect those values uh, in a meaningful way, uh, but also ensure that we remain competitive, competitive for minds, competitive for investments and competitive so for solutions. Thank you, Gedre. So we are moving to the, towards the end of, of this event. And before we, we finish, I would like to give the uh, panelists and the participants an opportunity to make um, one key recommendation and take home message. What would you like people to go home um, and take away from today? Uh, and let's start uh, in the room and then online. So Shona, let's start with you because I warned you before, so it might be easier. 
that's true <laughs> um i suppose from my side the one key thing that we need to take home is the fact that and it's been mentioned a few times today that european countries are all different um and so it's going to be a big exercise to bring everybody um onto the project at the same time and even within the the work that i've been doing with my colleagues we've seen a lot of variation even we've visited six countries so far but what we do see across the board is there's political will in all countries um, and that, I think, is a really key aspect, because once there's political will, everybody sees the benefit of the HDS. Um, and I think that's, that's definitely the first step. Um, and what we also heard was that countries really want to learn from each other, kind of what I think it was mentioned earlier, to get best practices from each other and see how things were done somewhere else. Um, so, yeah, that's my, my key finding for today. Thank you, Gusta. So from my side and from our side in general from uh, my organization <clears throat> and data saves lives what we would say is leave no one behind of course we keep on saying that but how not to leave no, uh, no one behind we have to be fast but we shouldn't rush um, so we have to make sure that the steps are followed in different rhythms in different settings in different disease areas different countries so there is no one solution fit them all and I'm sure the European Health Data Space uh, team right now is aware of these challenges, but it's very important to hear every voice that will be impacted by this space and that will benefit from this space. A clear Thank call you. to policymakers for the next steps in the legislative process, definitely. There you go. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Uh, well, I mean, I believe a lot of what's said and uh, today and um, uh, because it is a change, a big change, uh, which requires, uh, you know, systematic orchestrated management from all the involved parties. So I would say um, my wish or my takeaway is uh, for all the stakeholders to really try to uh, take active part in participating, expressing their views and expressing uh, their needs as well, and uh, making sure we hear all those um, practical uh, concerns which are raised by industry and manufacturers, by clinicians, by patients' representatives, by national government authorities into account and uh, work on them together uh, to really achieve uh, something that we are proud of it and which works for all of us. Thank you. Peter. Thanks very much. I would say um, let's build it together. Let's leverage the best that different stakeholders can bring. Let's focus on benefits and let's have a program approach to delivering a major change for the benefit of European patients. Thank you. It's a good program, Peter, and a good roadmap. Hans? Uh, maybe to say something that hasn't been mentioned that much before, it should be the trust of the citizens. I think in, in Denmark, we have a model where you can access all these different kinds of health data without consent. Uh, so our model is built on trust. So if we, we if we don't take that into account, we we may be undermining ourselves. So that would be one supplementary point. And the other point would be uh, this this gradual approach. Maybe we should start looking at the good experiences that is always there, already there around different European countries. I think uh, uh, that's the 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 data's work right now. Uh, going to make these country analysis should be a a good starting point to see what can we learn from each other. So that will be the other point, maybe, from my perspective. Thank you so much. We're not starting from scratch. I think that's that's the point. And we shouldn't leave aside the good practices and good examples that already exist. And last but not least, James. Andrew, thank you very much. I mean, I would say um, this is all very exciting. I'm very excited to support it. Let's also deal with um, simplifying the how, how this all happens. Um, leveraging projects like Eden or Pioneer to avoid adding another layer of complexity and confusion, at least for people like us. But generally, let's do this and let's do it with patients and health professionals. I'm sure we can do it. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Thank you very much with that. Um... Uh, I would like to thank all the participants, all the speakers uh, from the European Commission, from patient groups, from clinicians, member states. Uh, we heard a lot today um, and let's now put it to action. 
uh, for the next steps of this legislation. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you. Yeah. No. Yeah. They didn't hear. They didn't hear. So for those in the room, there's lunch in the back. Okay. okay. They just don't do that.